Welcome back, everybody, to Good Dudes Grow 2.0. I have a wonderful guest, a public speaker, author. Uh, she just wrote a, a, her, her current book that she just wrote, which is, is out right now. It's called The Gray Drinker's Reset, A Four-Week Journey to Wellness. Uh, I invited my guest on today because I think I don't only want to talk about plant-based medicine and psychedelics, but I also want to talk about mental health and different avenues of mental health. And you all know I'm a big fitness enthusiast enthusiast and i think her story what she's doing in the industry for for addiction and for ptsd with veterans is, is extremely uh needs to be told and i think it's a it's a path that a lot of us that especially first responders we, we can work on so i'd like to thank you to my show i'd like to thank carrie schnell to my show i hope i didn't butcher the last name <laughs> it's okay it's actually it's actually <laughs> shell but i i'm used to schnell. Shell. Okay. it's okay all good <laughs> well well, Carrie, thank you for coming on my show. I, I greatly appreciate it. I, I read a little bit about your story. Uh, I, I found it very intriguing. I, I think it's right down what we're trying to do and, and what we're trying to create also out in, in Costa Rica. And I believe that uh, telling your story to first responders is actually something that a lot of first responders need to listen to because there's a lot of abuse of either it's pills or alcohol in the first responder industry, especially now after the last couple of years of COVID of us continuously working, never getting a break, being in the mix of everything. So it's very, you know, it's going to be needed different types of avenues that actually we need to actually recover from. But before that, tell me a little bit about your background because your story is very interesting. Tell me a little bit how you got started in all the wellness industry and the addiction industry. Yeah, well, actually, my very start was I, I'm a midwife. That's initially, I was a midwife for a couple decades. And through that journey, wanting to keep growing um, in my, my practice as a primary care provider, I did some graduate work. And that's when the first inklings of doing research into the whole connection between mental wellness and physical activity came to me, just doing research and, and learning that. And actually I began promoting and developed what I called body brain breaks for schools at the elementary level, where I created a whole program where teachers would implement these three to five minute breaks a couple times a day, usually strategically before the more challenging academic subjects, because we know that that really stimulates the brain power and neurons and everything and, and allows the kids to actually settle and focus. So that was my initial foray into that, that connection. What got me into the field of um, addiction, it was just actually by chance. I had decided after a couple decades as a midwife that I wanted to explore other options. At that point I was, I, I lived in rural Nova Scotia in a small community. And so opportunities that were intriguing to me and that were a good suit for my experience and my profession weren't really available. So. I thought I'll do things that I enjoy. So I became a personal trainer. That's the time when I got my first yoga instructor certification and started working on my PhD. And it was through that sort of preliminary research again at that mind-body-spirit connection to addiction and alcoholism that I really discovered that yoga, meditation, and physical activity are as effective and actually in a lot of cases more effective in treating alcoholism and addiction than traditional therapies. And at that time, uh, a new residential facility was opening close by and I was hired as the director of health and wellness and given carte blanche to write the program. And so I took all of the knowledge and the experience and things I knew that helped me in my life um, and I and I developed that program, which was the basis of my first book, Yoga Recovery. Because I just knew even in my own life, raising seven kids and just all that that brings, that if I didn't go for a run for a day, every day, to kind of just reset or go for a hike or do something in the physical, and then later really became integrated with meditation and yoga, that I was never quite peaceful and I didn't have that inner serenity that I really was needing. That's interesting. And you, you kind of felt in the same path as I felt because 
I believe in the whole mind-body thing. I'm kind of a competitive athlete, and a lot of several athletes understand it as well. They understand that if the mind, there's two things that are going to give up. Either your mind's going to quit or your body's going to quit. One of them's going to quit first, and if you can figure out which one quits first, you can basically train that to keep up with the other one, so therefore you have a better outcome and performance. That's that's basically what we do, but you, it's the same thing in recovery type mentality, correct? correct? It is. And it's interesting when you are bringing in the PSD um, component. I was um, doing some naval leadership training where I was involved when candidates for promotion in the Navy in Canada on the East Coast, they would go through a program. And I was a civilian hired to do some assessment in that piece. And it was in working with two of the veterans who were also um, working with the Navy that hearing their stories in Bosnia and the trauma and what they experienced that I honestly don't think many people comprehend the true horrors that people experience when they're on the front line. And it was through the conversations with them and I was working on my first book that this whole notion, it really clicked to me that when someone is in the depths of their addiction and they are hitting rock bottom, they may do things or take on behaviors that when they were clean and sober, they would never even consider doing. And I realized the same was being asked of our service people, that when they are in the front lines, they may be asked to do things and witness and experience things that when they are back home, they would never even imagine being in the position to either witness or have to carry out. And so it shifts your moral compass when you're hitting rock bottom and you may be stealing from loved ones or whatever the behavior may be, you have shifted your moral compass. And the same with our service men and women that sometimes they're asked to shift that moral compass in order to perform what's being asked of them. And so we developed again a program called Moral Compass Therapy that took those same realizing, well, they need basically the same program with yoga, meditation, and physical activity to help them regain their wellness. Yeah, that's incredible. And I try to tell people a lot that the first responder community for like firefighters, paramedics kind of are parallel to, to the military. And the reason why I say that is because we had somebody visit the station one time. And of course, we always, every time we see a service member, we see, we say, you know, thank you for your service. And this one individual said to us, no, he says, don't thank me for my service. I thank you for your service. And it kind of blew everybody, you know, at the station away, kind of like, we don't understand what you're, you're saying. And he goes, well, I had, I made a decision to go and, and, you know, fight for my country. I may or may not have seen battle. That that is the decision. We know that we're going to see battle because you see it on TV, you see war movies. See, we understand that we're going into that. He goes, but you guys, you get a job that you sign on a dotted line for 30 years, 20, 30 years of a career. You are guaranteed to see death, mayhem, uh, things nobody else can ever imagine. So you spend the next 20 or 30 years taking your 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 basic moral compass, like you said, and kind of hiding it, pushing it down so it doesn't come out. And thus, this is the reason why uh, firefighters have a higher divorce rate because they go home, they can't they can't express themselves, the empathy is gone, the, the feelings are no longer there. They don't feel comfortable talking to anybody. It's extremely hard, you know, you, you did dealt with, with veterans and everything. You know the type A personality. It's hard to just call somebody and say that you don't know and say, hey, call this right. number, talk to them. Yeah, that's, that's, it's gonna, so what do we do? We go to the bottle the pill, the sleep aids, to this, to that, something that we can just either numb ourselves or basically help ourselves sleep to forget so that in two or three days we can do it over again until we can just, you know, retire and hopefully never see it again. But then we go through a different type of PTSD because we just spent 30 years with the same, our secondary family that we're we're cut off. Yes. We're no longer allowed, to, almost allowed to see. And so it starts over into a different it's era. It's funny, avenue. you touched on a couple really important things. I think as as people, we have an innate need to bond. And when we can't do that because, say, of trauma or abuse or mental illness and tragedy, and we can't connect with other individuals, we will connect to something that gives us some sense of relief. And as you said, 
in in your world and in and for many people it's drugs it's alcohol it could be pornography it could be gambling whatever that something is that you find you can connect with and get a sense of relief the other amazing thing that i didn't actually put this together with people in your career is that when i met these men who had been in the forces part of why they were coming back as civilians and doing this naval leadership training was because that world that you're in is so intense and so deeply intimate and personal that your other service men are the ones who understand and relate to you more than anyone even if you have a healthy marriage or even if you have other healthy friendships and so they were coming back they didn't even care if they got paid of course they were but it was to be still part of that whole world to still feel that connection and that camaraderie to feel that this is actually ultimately where i belong and these are my people and so it's interesting i've never thought of that in terms of your profession how after 20 30 years when you step back it does leave a gaping hole and so again what are you going to fill that hole with you can be someone like yourself who has realized that physical activity and and finding other things that really support you mind body spirit are the best things or you're going to go down in uh, probably an unhappy path right right e- exactly exactly i'd like to touch a little bit on your first book the uh, the, the great drinking basically because i be- i be- i'm not going to believe i think We definitely there's there's definitely a drinking issue problem in the first responders or whether it's police officers and I'm sure in the military as well but it, you know it, our big thing is camaraderie let's go have a drink you had a bad day let's go have a drink we had a bad day let's go have a drink and sometimes it doesn't seem like you may have a problem so it's difficult to to actually come out and say of a problem but according to what you saying do we is there a reason for us just completely stop drinking and not have the camaraderie afterwards or, or do you explain that in the book do you, you talk yeah, a little bit so, about it i think first off i think we do that society in general that benchmark of what normal acceptable drinking has really changed and shifted and especially with covid i mean women report a 41% increase in heavy drinking which is five or more drinks at one time and listen that's when this whole notion of gray drinking really hit home for me Um I realized that you know I am a bit of a type A personality I'd be more into that and so I'm very organized with my lists and if I complete everything on my list in the day and you know even if I'm chugging the last you know f- however much of water to check that off my list before I could open the bottle and have a glass of wine right and so I find that okay I would have a glass of wine before dinner or while I was making dinner and then I would sit and have a glass of wine with dinner and then maybe have a glass of wine over the course of the evening even though it was over you know 6 to 8 hours I was still having 3 quarters of a bottle of wine and if I was out celebrating maybe I had that fourth glass like on you know on a weekend night and I was never drunk or intoxicated <laughs> right. it was just a gradual thing and so I think for a lot of people a lot of our socialization has now involved drinking. You go out for lunch, you have drinks, brunch, dinners. Um even if you're physically active, you do the triathlon and then you all go out and you have beer, right? Or you you go for a hike and let's have lunch afterwards and we'll all have drinks. So it's become a way for us to connect with one another. And what the interesting thing is with the gray drinking reset is when you take that out of the equation you start to realize actually it's not the the alcohol that's making me unwind it's kind of the ritual around the alcohol it's the pouring myself a nice drink in a glass and taking the time to sit down and taking that me time or it's oh i'm with my friends we seem to be more leisurely when we have the drink it it, it kind of gives us permission to chat more freely but we don't realize we can do all that without the alcohol and actually our relationships are stronger and more genuine and authentic without the alcohol. Exact. That's exactly. That's you know, now that I think about it, 
Uh, I just I just don't like drinking more than two two glasses of wine. I, I can't have beer anymore because it, it bloats me. But just having two glasses of wine. But I just don't like the feeling being in fitness and being always you know want to go yeah. the next day to have that workout or thing. Now they kind of built me. It kind of really, I don't want to feel bad the next day. So that's that that's where the whole and this is a whole different subject for for probably somebody else. That's where the whole cannabis infused drinks where it seems because it, it's they're coming out to where not only are they healthier but they're not. You, you can do the same thing but not feel as as terrible the next day but you'll get the same feeling but that's no, just a and, whole different you know, discussion and bringing it back to the whole PTSD <laughs> thing my friends were definitely as part of their therapy you know even a few years ago they were you know a medical marijuana and it was helping with their sleep sleep is a huge thing right and so they were just like holy shit I'm like sleeping that's again right. and it was such a wonderful thing for them and you know alcohol really is a toxin and it's not good for your liver and so you know having another replacement if you if you want you know pot can be a great thing it can be a healthier choice for people right and that that's where we're creating the, the research and the treatment and kind of like we're building the center we're building in costa rica so we can actually get proven data on and this type of stuff we're not looking to get the old high and have the munchies and and you know out eating all the smarties and and, and everything like that we want the medical data to show that because i have a cbd company i provided some of my uh, federal firefighters with some cbd because they were actually in pain no not not any no thc stuff because we're still not allowed to take the low dose that's that's sort of legal but we can't touch any thc but giving it to them several people came back to me and says you know not only did it relieve the pain but it also made me feel comfortable relieving the ability mm. to actually open up and so that that's what it led me down to like well we don't have to drink a, a full 40 of Jack Daniels to open up. You know, a couple of drops of CBD all of a sudden open these type A personalities who run into burning buildings, destroy anything to save a life. And all of a sudden, a couple of drops turn these people into a, you know, I hate to use the word like little puppy dog, but they're able to open up and say stuff that they've never said before. And that's like, well, we need to find more and more data on this type of medicine, because if we can do this, A, so they don't have to use the alcohol, B, use something that's actually healthier for, your, for them, and, and C, create instead of this everlasting, let's wait till it's too late kind of medicine, but find a way we can actually make it a preventative. So you get an 18 year old who decides to sign up for the fire service where they're not allowed to retire until 30 years later, whose brain is not built to actually see the stuff that he's going to see, create a yearly process to where they're able to get not only their, their body scanned, mm. but their brain scanned at the same way. Maybe we will, we can stop the PTSD from happening. If we put these preventive medicines in, 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 in process and that's where I, I believe stuff like you're coming up with the fitness uh the mind body soul connection working together so talk a little bit more about the compass pathway because i'm interested so in hearing a little bit more about that you know yoga i love doing yoga when i was at the center i'm no longer at the, at the center i just work i on my own um but it was a great leveler and you know you don't have to be a yogi or someone with the perfect body to do yoga. Yoga is about no judgment and, you know, just feeling good about yourself. And so you could have this 60 year old corporate businessman who was there for alcohol. You could have the 18 year old opiate person and every kind of combination in between. And when they came to yoga, most of them hadn't done yoga before. And so it was an opportunity for them in a gentle, non-competitive, non-judgmental way to actually start reconnecting with the physical self. And the physical self is an amazing gateway to the mental and spiritual self. So that's where the yoga came in. So if people weren't in the position to start jogging or physically they had just, their body just was in no shape. They had either just detoxed for however amount of time, and now they were at the center. The yoga was a very gentle way to introduce that connection. Once that connection was ignited, and they started to think, wow, I feel my body feels good. I actually like moving this thing <laughs> that I have. And that would encourage them to do more. <laughs> 
It would also, with the meditation piece, I would work together with the team of psychologists and other addiction therapists. And so we'd all be, it was a collaborative practice and we would have our, our team meetings. And so I would know exactly where everyone was at. I would do group work with them also. And so we'd be sharing the insights that we were gleaning. And so I could craft guided meditations that would help people go deeper into the emotion or maybe it was trauma or wherever they were stuck. And meditation allows you to go there and to kind of just sit with it and realize that you're not really in harm or danger and you can just feel it and sit with it. And then you can come out of the meditation and realize that you had self-soothed. And so you start to develop your own mechanism to help you when you are in distress, in emotional and mental distress, you know, and then that all really ties in to that you start cultivating self-esteem and you start coming back to the knowledge that you have self-worth. And I like to really differentiate between the two because self-worth is something we're born with, you know, a little baby is born in its perfection and we love it. And, and we have such joy and love for this little baby, but they don't have a title. They don't have an income. They don't have a house or career. It's just worthy because it is. Self-esteem is like a bank account. I can do things right. that make me feel more, have value, that increase my esteem. I may be kind to people. I may, whatever it is in the positive, increases that self-esteem. When you take on behaviors that are negative, they'll deplete that bank account. So all of these things together really, A, remind someone, man, I'm worthy just because of you know, I may have fucked up a lot. I may have done this. I may have experienced trauma. I may have been numbing out, whatever it may be, but actually I'm worthy. Like I'm here and I'm worth it. And there's a reason I'm still here. And you start to, to acknowledge and receive that. And it also builds your self-worth. You realize, wow, I'm taking care of myself. I'm doing the work. I am doing the stuff that's making me feel good. And so it's, it's an amazing process. That's incredible. And, and I've tried yoga. I'm terrible at it. I've, <laughs> well, I can't say I'm terrible at it. Uh, I, I know it's not an easy process. And that and that and the reason why I say that so everybody understands that is that it's not just I don't want people to think it's just down sitting down and stretching it. it there's there is mm -hmm. some there's work that needs to be done. And, and with mental health, like yoga yes. and like fitness, you got to put in the work. And if you don't put in the work, like he says, you're not going to be able to build that little bit of self-esteem. So all you do is a small steps at once, that self-esteem and make you want to do more and then want to do more and more. Exactly yes, like you said. For sure. But you have to and put you know, in the work. And I think that a goal would be whether it's, you know, people using CBD medicinally and it hopefully down the road, they'll be able to have opportunities to really cultivate the same benefits on their own. So it's, I think CBD can be a very, and other psychedelics, ayahuasca, whatever it may be, can be extremely valuable tools and they help us, they get us to maybe to the next level. And I think ideally it would be my hope that we learn to, to create behaviors that serve us we cultivate relationships that are healthy and meaningful. And I think a lot of that has been lost. I think a lot of that true connection has been lost. I think social media has played a huge in, a part in people not feeling they can be them, their authentic, genuine self. And we're going for some falsehood with likes and cultivating these personas and images that right. are curated and staged and whatever. And so, it doesn't allow us to have those intimate right. connections that we probably, that I really think we had more readily beforehand. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more with that. So now is, is the moral compass out yet or are you still working on it? We have been doing some trial runs and we're actually looking at funding from the Canadian government for from the forces so that it's service people don't have to pay for it so that it doesn't become a financial burden because that's a huge reality. Yeah. 
Yeah, especially especially nowadays. <laughs> everything everything is becoming a, a huge burden. Carrie, I pr- I appreciate you coming on my show. I, I think that that is the perfect note to stop on. What I'd like to do is I'd like you to tell everybody where they can actually reach you if they actually uh, needed to talk to you and found out like hey maybe you know we can help with the funding sure. whatsoever. How, where the, could they reach out okay, to you? you social media and everything, and we'll put them in the show notes as well. Or you can go to the Gray Drinking Reset and. You'll find me there too. Yeah. And I'm in Costa Rica too. So next time you're here. Perfect. Yeah. I am in Playa Grande. Are you? Where, 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 where are you? What area? Going to be. We just bought uh, 25, 25 very, acres very, out in Uvita. So we'll have to connect. So that's, that's where we're definitely Perfect. 100%. That's well, where we're actually you. looking it's for. It's been an so honor we're really excited about today. It. And thank, and thank <laughs> you for all your work. It's, Thank you, thank you, and thank you for your work for helping individuals like us that actually, you know, and once again, I said it's very hard for people mm-hmm. like us to actually come out of our box, but when people come up with great programs and great ideas that, and find ways to actually help us, thank you. it, it really a goes day. a long way for people like us. Thank you for tuning in. If you're still listening to this, that means you gained something out of this episode. So make sure you share it with a friend, leave a review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode of The Good Dudes Grow 2.0.